All right, hi everybody. Uh, looks like most people are joining with just audio, so we can't uh, get thumbs up and thumbs down, but hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, welcome to the Virtual Fellow Track Symposium. Uh, oh, there we go. Hello, one person on video. Um, my name is Jake McSparin. Uh, I'm one of the co-chairs for the Critical Care Pillar uh, of the Fellows Track. Jeremy Richards is the other uh, co-chair. Hopefully you've all uh, met him at least virtually in the, the prior talks and you will in the future. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to advance my slides, which is not working. Sometimes Zoom's been freezing if you unshare and share. Okay. All right. Um, so we are very pleased today uh, to welcome Dr. Janelle uh, Badulak, uh, who is an ATS fellow. She's from the University of Washington. She's an assistant professor of emergency medicine as well as pulmonary and critical care medicine. Uh, and she's the director of ECMO education for the University of Washington, also on the education task force um, for ELSO. Uh, she's a real expert uh, educator and a clinical expert in ECMO and I've learned a lot from her and I suspect you all will today as well. And um, just some reminders at 5 p.m. today there's a, another FTS workshop controversies and sleep disordered breathing um, by Babak Moklesi um, from the University of Chicago. Uh, next week uh, Dr. Bob Owens from UCSD uh, we'll be speaking about non-CPAP treatments for sleep apnea. That's Tuesday, July 28th at 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. And then the final webinar for the FTS, uh, Dr. Thomas Bleck at Northwestern, who gives a great talk on uh, neurocritical care emergencies, uh, will be speaking July 28th at 4 p.m. Um, so we encourage you all to register for these. And while we all miss meeting you in person, hopefully you're able to experience at least some of this and some of the networking um, these are great opportunities to hear from expert educators and experts in the field and really um, start, to, start to get to know people in our field. Um, also, please, uh, we'll put the link in the chats, but also, you, or you can use this code um, and try to evaluate the sessions. We're really trying to make this as good as possible and very open to feedback uh, as we navigate the, the sort of virtual world for these types of conferences. Uh, if you do miss any of these or you want to go back and review, we will be archiving the presentations um, and the slides will be available for many of these sessions. Um, and with that, we'll hand things over uh, to Dr. Badalak and get started. And please, um, if you want to turn your cameras on so we can say hi, go for it. Uh, if you want to use the chat freely, please do that. Um, we would like this to be as interactive as possible. All right, welcome. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna work on getting my slides up here. And um, yeah, so really glad to be here. Sad that I don't get to meet some of you guys in person for this talk that we had, we've been planning for a while. Um, but nevertheless, I'm excited to talk about ECMO and ECMO education. So there's gonna be some interactivity throughout this. So it isn't just getting, um, you know, receiving a PowerPoint lecture. And I'd really love it if you guys just like to mentioned if you can use the chat um, to talk about um, as I kind of ask you some questions and think about these clinical cases. I know that there's going to be a wide uh, variety of ECMO familiarity amongst the fellows. Some um, fellows have been taking care of ECMO patients for a while. Um, there are some people who are novice and haven't taken care of ECMO patients. So we're going to try to um, so any questions that you have, um, detailed or general, please um, ask those questions in the chat box at any time and uh, interact with the chat box too, okay? Um, and then if we have time for the, at the end, we can do some questions too, but if we pepper the questions through when they are uh, most relevant and helpful for your learning, that's, that would be lovely. Okay, cool, so let's get started. Um, so our outline of things we're gonna to cover today, since we could talk for days, or I could talk for days about ECMO, we're gonna do a couple of things in particular. We're gonna make sure we all have the same foundation of outlining ECMO circuit components, then talk a bit about VA and VV ECMO patient selection considerations, some of the data, 
Um, and then we're going to go through some common complications that pertain to inadequate centrifugal pump flow. And then with VV, uh, issues with hypoxemia and recirculation, and with VA, issues with hypo hypotension and differential oxygenation. Um, so to get started with the circuit components, of course, VA ECMO is cardiopulmonary bypass essentially that we're extending into the ICU setting where we're draining venous blood, moving it through a centrifugal pump and a gas exchange device like a membrane lung and putting the blood back into the arterial system. So bypassing the heart lung system, providing cardiopulmonary support. VV, same idea. It's just that the return location is different where we're returning the blood in the central venous system and just bypassing the lungs. So trying to do all the gas exchange with the membrane lung before the blood goes into the native heart lung system. So only pulmonary support. So for VA ECMO, we're going to focus on uh, peripheral VA ECMO where um, in this particular talk today, the most common con uh, cannula configuration would be where a drainage cannula is situated in the right atrium or even up to the SVC, draining blood, and you can see it in this chest radiograph here, and then also in the patient's right leg here, goes to the circuit, comes back um, after, being, uh, after CO2 is removed and blood is oxygenated, and it's pushed back into the arterial system. And here, if you had an abdominal plane film, you could see the tip of the arterial cannula and then the cannula over, over here on the, on the femoral artery. And are you able to see, um, Jay, can you see my cursor as I mouse over the slides just to make sure? Yes. Great. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Um, so, and then VV ECMO, um, there's a couple of different cannula configurations that we can uh, do for peripheral VV. Um, this is the most common one, probably is femoral IJ, where we're draining blood from the IVC right atrial junction and the cannula in this patient here in the groin. You can see the dark red deoxygenated central venous blood, um, and then uh, returning through the internal jugular vein, and then the blood is ideally moving across that tricuspid valve into the right atrium and increasing the oxygen content of the blood entering the pulmonary arteries. Here's a chest radiograph where you can see that vein, the tip of the venous drainage cannula here, and then your tip of your arterial return cannula here. And then depending on the, the characteristics of the individual cannulas, these are a couple of centimeters apart. All right. So we talked about where the cannulas are. Let's talk about the circuit next. So the circuit is generally has a couple of basic components. There's a lot of different circuits out there that have all kinds of bells and whistles, but all of them will have these basic components where you have that drainage cannula, a pump, and pretty much always just doing centrifugal pumps, not roller pumps like dialysis and medication feeding tube kind of roller pumps. We'll talk more about centrifugal pumps. Then the membrane lung itself. And with a membrane lung, you have sweep gas, which is basically what that membrane artificial lung is breathing, we could say. Then there's a heat exchanger. So most of the time temperature is controlled in the membrane lung, but not all circuits actually have this integrated. And then it moves to the return cannula and back into the patient. So let's just look through a video of one, one way to set up your circuit um, using the McKay Cardio Help system for a VV patient where we have a drainage cannula that's pulling blood out of the patient moving towards the circuit. This one has a bubble detector that'll alarm if air gets entrained. Then it has another um, little <clears throat> thing right here that's gonna continuously monitor hemoglobin and oxygen saturation of the blood that's being pulled out of the patient. Then it moves to this centrifugal pump where this is the motor and then there's some integrated pressure sensors. So there's a venous pressure here, for example, that's negative, sucking the blood out of the patient. Then there's an internal pressure, which is positive. So it's on the other side of the pump, but right before you go into the membrane lung. Then there's the membrane lung or gas exchange device here. Then the blood moves past out back towards the patient and you transduce a pressure here, which is this post membrane or arterial pressure that's also positive. Then there's a pump screen over here for this particular circuit. We'll talk about more. Then there's a flow probe that tells you exactly how many liters per minute you're pushing through the circuit. And it also will detect bubbles. And then the blood flow moves all the way back towards the patient and now is bright red, of course, and then VV is headed into the internal jugular. Um, and then we're gonna look at gas flow. 
So this is the other um, thing that you can change aside from what we do with the pump where you have pressurized air and oxygen and then you blend it. So this is an external blender. It's the same thing as what's internalized in all your ventilators, your FDO2. Um, and that's rather than saying FIO2, we need a new term for ECMO. Then there's a uh, flow meter, which is going to control the liters per minute that you push that sweep gas through your gas exchange device. And we'll talk more about how that variable is managed. So this is the pump console screen for a McKay a cardio help system. There's lots of different systems that are out there. I'm not really partial to one or the other, but this one's just kind of easy for teaching. And we can talk about all of the data that you can get from an ECMO circuit. And then you can also, um, you don't need all of this data though, of course, to take care of ECMO patients. So the only thing you actually have any control over is the speed. So you're, you're setting the speed and then you're going to measure the flow, but it's going to be based on resistance throughout the circuit. And a really helpful pieces of data can be if you transduce these pressures through the circuit to figure out where resistance is changing. So we talked about there's a venous pressure or the inlet pressure, which is negative, And that's the pressure that it takes to suck that blood out of the patient when you increase the revolutions per minute of your centrifugal pump to set up that pressure differential to pull blood. Then you have this internal pressure, which is your first positive pressure that's pushing the blood through the membrane lung. There's a pressure drop across the membrane lung, and that's measured with this arterial pressure. That's whatever pressure's left over. And then there's this concept of the delta P, which is just doing the math. This 300 minus 275 is 25. So that's going to be representative of the resistance of flow across that membrane lung, which is a resistor. And then you have some other information. We, men we mentioned this pre-membrane saturation. They call it the SVO2 in this particular uh, circuitry. Um, and this, this is just that saturation of blood that's being drained wherever you decided to put your drainage cannula. So let's move on from the basics of the circuit um, and into patient selection. So we're going to have this first interactive piece. Meet Steve. He's a 35-year-old uh, man with COVID-19 ARDS. Um, he's on day four of invasive mechanical ventilation. He's prone or muscularly blocked, inhaled epoprosinol. And these are his ventilator settings over here. And this is his most recent gas. And he's on a little bit of norepinephrine. Um, so in the chat box, let me type in, we're just going to take a minute um, of, do you think he's a VV ECMO candidate? Is there more data that you'd like to be able to make this decision? Um, what would be, you know, things, potential contraindications that you'd be thinking about and you'd need more information to make this decision? Or do you feel like he's maximally medically managed? So just take a, we're just going to take a couple of seconds and have you guys Chat, type in the chat box and then we'll circle back and discuss some of the things you came up with um, and then we're going to unpack it. I love some of these comments. Keep them coming. You guys are coming up with great ideas. Okay, nice job guys. So I'm seeing things that are really important pieces of information like other comorbidities. So does this person have a underlying life uh, limiting illness already? Um, I saw renal function and prognosis, organ failure, um, things like, I also saw the REST score in there. Um, which is great. So thinking about, is there acute organ failure? Is this patient so sick they're going to die despite ECMO? Then the hematologic considerations, um, coagulopathy, is this person actively bleeding? Um, and then also going in with the acute 
uh, acute organ failure is the brain affected? Or is there any way that we, un what was his last neurologic exam? Did the patient have a cardiac arrest, et cetera? And then interesting hospital staffing going to be very relevant because our uh, ECMO criteria, especially during this pandemic, which we've understood are going to be affected by capacity. So fantastic. And we'll kind of circle back with this. And so now I'm going to show you and introduce you to another patient. This is Sandy. So she's 55 history. She's um, came into the ER complaining of palpitations for a while. She's hypotensive with rapid AFib, cool extremities. Um, she's intubated, cardioverted, amio, persistently hypotensive with end organ dysfunction. And you have her ventilator settings here on the left. This is her apical four chamber echo. This is her numbers on a right heart cath. And then these are her, her vasoactives currently. So take a minute, um, type in the chat box some thoughts of the discussion and more information you'd need for whether or not she's a VA ECMO candidate. Do we think that she's sick enough for it? Is it the right device? Do we have other considerations, more data we need to know if we should exclude this level of support, et cetera? Okay, so yeah, like thinking about what are the exit strategies I see coming up here because we have more options for exit strategies with patients with um, heart failure. Is this person a transplant candidate or an MCS candidate? What device is right for this patient? Um, how sick is this person? I like someone's coming, look, thinking about looking at the EF and the amount of support in liters per minute. Um, that the patient would require in light of this patient's cardiac index of 1.3. Um, and thinking about um, if there is some reversibility, like the ischemia workup, is there anything that we can do that we would think that this person would be able to have native recovery? And then all the other things that you guys already talked about with the VV patient, how bad is her organ, acute organ injury? And does she have any other medical problems? And what was her last neurologic exam? Is she bleeding? All of that stuff, of course, will carry over into this discussion. So let's go ahead and just uh, unpack this and talk about an overview of indications and, and contraindications. So the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization is an international organization that creates guidelines and houses a registry for hundreds of ECMO centers around the world. And their recommendations are acute severe cardiopulmonary failure with uh, a high mortality risk that's refractory to conventional therapy. These patients are potential candidates for ECMO, but that this is a bridge to recovery, so or durable organ replacement or decision. So we really need um, ECMO to be a used for a disease process with a solution. You don't want to enter into um, you don't want to put your patient on ECMO support if you don't have a reasonable chance that you can either reverse this process with native recovery or you have some other exit strategy to, when you need to get them off. So discontinuation strategies, including, of course, native organ recovery, which is usually our option for VV ECMO unless we're bridging to lung transplant, which is rarer unless it's chronic lung disease that's decompensated. For our VA ECMO patients, durable mechanical circulatory support, and then of course transplant, heart transplant or lung transplant. And then if none of these three options are available, um, then we're looking at end of life care. And that can be uh, ethically kind of tricky if we um, find, wind, up, wind up in a place with no exit strategy. General contraindications, all the right things you brought up. The futility, is the patient too sick? So they're they have terrible liver failure is usually, that's the big one, acute liver injury with bad synthetic dysfunction um, and coagulopathy. 
um, that these patients tend to do very poorly. Many people have an AKI in general, we're not too worried about that. Or if they've been on conventional therapy too long, we have a, quite a bit of uh, growing data to suggest that patients um, placed on VA ECMO after seven to 10 days of high intensity mechanical ventilation do not survive ECMO. We talked about pre-existing life living conditions. So do they have CNS pathology, end stage diseases, um, patients that are too sick to, uh, that are gonna preclude a um, reasonable chance at functional recovery and rehab through an ECMO run? advanced age, nobody knows where this is. <laughs> and then uh, vascular access, we need to be able to actually put these cannulas in somewhere. So some specific diseases that we generally think of for ECMO with VA, refractory cardiogenic shock, of uh, various kinds, acute MI, myocarditis, acute decompensated chronic heart failure, um, cardiac arrest, massive PE, which is really, ECMO is really built to bypass the right ventricle. Um, environmental hypothermia, we can control temperature very quickly, cardiotoxic congestion with shock or arrest, and then post-cardiac surgery where patients can't wean from bypass. Um, BV ECMO, we have the most data for the ARDS population, of course, can also be used for refractory acute hypercarbia. We think of the acute asthma exacerbation. Um, pulmonary injury, in particular bronchopleural fistula, um, that is medical or traumatic. Uh, bridging to lung transplant, of course, and then post-thoracic surgery re with refractory gas exchange that we think is temporary bridge. So when we think about, okay, um, with those diseases for VV ECMO, what is the, how severe does your respiratory failure really need to be before we'd say this is truly refractory to conventional therapy? And this is something that nobody really knows the answer to, but at least I can tell you um, what a couple of, uh, or two of our, our two <laughs> randomized control tiles looking at VV ECMO and the ARDS population, the CESAR and the AOLIA trial, these were the inclusion criteria that they used for those studies. And the EOLIA criteria are very similar to the ELSO guidelines, where you have a patient who is definitely, you've optimized PEEP, the patient's been deeply sedated, the patient is, um, you've tried pronin and plus or minus neuromuscular blockade, plus or minus inhaled um, pulmonary vasodilators. And it's in general going to be a P to F ratio less than a certain number for a duration of time. Most people will, you know, think about less than 80. There's also an argument of should we be trying to identify patients um, and put them on earlier, but there's, there's a lot of active discussion to suffice it to say. P to F and then of course pH with hypercarbia. I put up this modified um, Murray lung injury score because it was something that used, was used in the Caesar criteria. Essentially, it captures things like how high is their PEEP and how bad does their chest x-ray look and how bad is their compliance, um, So, and which is also captured in the pH and CO2 as you're trying to figure out how much you can liberalize your tidal volumes to maintain uh, lung protective ventilation. So, um, and then of course, despite maximal conventional therapy that you've actually tried all the appropriate things. To look at a couple of outcomes so we have an idea of how long are these patients actually surviving or, or how much are they surviving, the, we have the CSER trial where we moved patients um, to ECMO centers or to uh, the, the center where they were. We had a survival benefit, but not all the patients who went to an ECMO center went on ECMO. There were a couple of flu studies. I just include this one from JAMA that used propensity matching to um, see if there was an association of higher of uh, improved mortality in patients with flu in 2009 that were put on ECMO, um, and two of them showed uh, benefit. One did not, um, and then of course Eolia that many are familiar with. Um, with a, uh, a non-statistically significant uh, difference in survival that, would, uh, that was trending towards improved survival with ECMO, but not statistically significant. You can see these P to F ratios are pretty low, 75, 55, 72. Here's a smattering of a couple of bigger studies looking at VA ECMO outcomes. Um, it's kind of all over the the place and we don't have a randomized control trial, it's kind of hard to deny a patient mechanical support when their index and map are not consistent with uh, uh, life-sustaining numbers. Um, so these are a couple of different um, observational studies ranging from smaller case series to larger multi-center um, and registry databases all over the world and with uh, lots of different kinds of shock. 
We see this repeatedly that myocarditis has the best survival. So this is a good tool for your patient with acute myocarditis. And then these two studies looked at a smattering of different kinds of cardiogenic shock with you know, survival ranging somewhere between 26 to 45%. The cardiotomy patients, they seem to be around the 30s percent, has a, a, a more difficult survival rate. And then here was a pulmonary embolism, the largest case series I could find with 40 percent, with 70 percent of these guys actually were post-cardiac arrest. And then to just sum it up, the ECLS uh, registry report for ELSO, um, this is taking in 25,000 um, cardiac and pulmonary runs. And this is their um, survival rate. So 60% for pulmonary, 43 for cardiac, and 29 for ECPR. So patients are really only going to live about half of the time. Um, so these are very, very sick patients um, to begin with. Um, and just important to kind of keep that in your mind, especially when you're caring for ECMO patients. It's hard when only half of your patients are going to survive. And this is just survival, not necessarily survival with a um, meaningful outcome. So we've really got to be very selective with your patients. Okay, and at any time if there's questions along the way, go ahead and just throw them in the chat box. We're gonna move on to physiology now. So the pump, um, we're going, so the pump, if you, the only thing that you get to change with the pump is the speed, and then you're gonna measure the flow. And with centrifugal pumps, these things have preload and afterload just like the native heart. Um, and if you have changes in your preload or afterload resistance, you will have reflected changes in flow. So with preload, some of the things that you'll have um, that will affect your preload will be the size of your venous cannula and its resistance, the blood volume that's available in your central venous system, and then other things like intrathoracic and abdominal pressure that will externally compress your, dra your drainage cannula in the cava. And then with afterload, um, your arterial cannula resistance and the membrane lung resistance. So higher resistance is going to result in lower flow for a set R, uh, RPM or speed. And then with VA, of course, your systemic vascular resistance and mean arterial pressure will factor into things because you're trying to return that blood flow into a high pressure system instead of a low pressure system with VB. So this pump is preload sensitive and afterload limited. And that's the real utility of transducing those pressures that are pre and post pump for when you have problems with inadequate flow, you can start to figure out what the differential diagnosis may be and identify where the lesion is, like some neurology speak, for the increased resistance in your circuit and then figure out where it is and deal with it. So here's the most common cause of inadequate um, flow is going to be an adequate pre pump preload. So you guys can see here that this venous drainage line is intermittently shaking or chattering. And then if we looked at the cardio help screen, what's going to happen is intermittently you have this venous alarm where you have excessively negative venous pressures in the setting of choking your blood flow. So it goes all the way from four liters down to one liter once you have that sh tubing shaking. And this is from essentially a spin down event where your speed is gonna be high enough that it sucks the cava down onto the cannula and then it uh, abruptly will limit or stop flow. So we think of all the reasons that this could be happening with hypovolemia or potentially with external compression on that cannula and we need to do something about that. So moving into the membrane lung, um, we have blood flow on the left and gas flow on the right here. So the saturation of oxygen before you enter the membrane lung, that's the same as on the cardio help, that SVO2. Um, it's the saturation of the blood that's central and it's leaving your, and it's before it goes through the membrane lung. Then the, you oxygenate your blood and then at the end, at the outlet of the membrane lung, you have this S post O2. So these are some of the ELSO terms we're trying to unify for talking about ECMO physiology. And then the FDO2 is just like what the membrane lung is inhaling. Like what is your membrane lung breathing in? And essentially these, the membrane lung is these little microtubules and the lumen of the microtubule is that sweet gas. And on the outside it's bathed in blood where the gas exchange is gonna occur across a semi-permeable membrane. You get to affect the sweep flow rate and the, i.e., the liters per minute at which you push this gas through the membrane lung. So to look at it in more detail, you have this net essentially of microtubules 
which is polymethylpentene in the membrane lung. And inside of it, you're gonna have uh, the sweep gas. And then you see the little red blood cells that are moving through with eddy currents um, and interacting with the semi-permeable membrane and uh, promoting gas exchange. You also have water um, that's temperature controlled and many different, there's lots of different ways that different oxygenators or membrane lungs set this up. But this is why we're able to rapidly change a patient's temperature for post cardiac arrest cooling or for rewarming after hypothermic arrest. Um, and then you can see here blood flow is moving on one side, sweep on the other. And as you increase that sweep glass flow rate, you'll set up this high diffusion gradient for CO2, which diffuses 20 times faster than oxygen. So this sweep gas flow rate is essentially analogous to your minute ventilation in the native lung. So as you increase the sweep, glass, sweep gas flow rate, you're going to remove more CO2 from the blood. So let's move in to VV ECMO. So here we're gonna interact uh, again. So we're going back to Steve. So Steve, we decided to cannulate him for VV ECMO. He had an AKI, but not a lot of um, other acute organ injuries. Shock wasn't too bad. Um, and he was an otherwise healthy 35-year-old guy with uh, COVID-19. So on the left here, we have his uh, pump uh, console screen with some data here where we've got the speed um, and the flow and his inlet pressure and then the post-pump pressures and the drainage saturation. And we have his sweep set at three and his FDO2 set at 100%. This is what we set his ventilator to. He's on pressure control, and these are his vital signs. So his um, SpO2 is 80%. So what do you guys think? Where are the, what are the ways that we could improve this patient's oxygenation, increase his SpO2? We'll just take a couple, I'll take one minute to have you guys throw some ideas in the chat box. Okay, awesome. Lots of good suggestions and thoughts and considerations. So we have a couple of different things that we should be thinking about. I like that someone brought up, is there recirculation? So we'll hold that thought and important to exclude that. And then I also saw, are there clots across the membrane lung? So is the membrane lung functioning properly? And what might be something that we can figure out from this console screen that would tell us whether or not we think there's high resistance across this membrane lung with clotting, if you wanna throw that in the comments, the change in pressure, exactly, Tommy. So if we had a higher driving pressure here, this delta P across the membrane lung, so internal is pre-membrane, arterial is post-membrane for the cardio help set, then this would go up and you'd worry that that resistance is higher and the clots are worse. Um, and then um, the other question, the other idea was, should we mess around with the ventilator? Um, and, uh, or, and I love that people were not excited to use the ventilator, which means you guys are thinking about, let's protect those lungs and important lungs. So can we use ECMO? And we had a couple of people say, increase ECMO flow. And that sounds like a great idea. And is the primary tenant of how do we improve oxygenation with VV ECMO? So let's unpack that. 
So um, let's just kind of define all of these terms for identification of oxygen saturation through the circuit with VV. So we have this pre-membrane oxygen saturation from the blood in your drainage cannula. It moves to the pump and membrane let lung where you set your sweep uh, FDO2, which is usually set at 100%, but doesn't need to be. It's whatever you need for your post-oxygen saturation to be 100%. Um, and then along, so, so that's going to be pushed back into the pulmonary artery, the SVO2, but it's going to be a mixture of both what ECMO pushes into your right atrium and what's entrained around the cannulas from your central venous oxygen saturation. So there's going to be some blood that didn't go through the ECMO circuit that comes into your heart. Then it's going to go through your native lungs, which really aren't doing much or you wouldn't be on ECMO, um, where things for oxygenation will affect your I mean, your PEEP and your FiO2 will affect oxygenation. And then whatever you end up with on the other side will be your aortic saturation. So um, it's essentially with VV ECMO, we have two circulations that are functioning in series. And later we'll, we'll contrast how that's different with VA. Um, in general, like you guys pointed out, we don't want to mess with the ventilator if at all possible. We want the ventilator settings to be um, as least injurious as possible to avoid barrow and volume and atelectic trauma and potentially um, alveolar damage from exposure of high oxygen, high uh, alveolar oxygen tension, um, which is a little like shaky. We're not really sure where that line is, but suffice it to say, if you injure the lungs while you're on ECMO, you'll be on ECMO forever. So we really want to try to use the pump. So why is it that increased blood flow actually improves oxygenation? What's the physiology behind that? Well, these illustrations talk about it. And essentially on the left, you have a patient who's going to oxygenate better. This is a patient with high ECMO blood flow to cardiac output ratio. So you can see this big red arrow. Most of the blood that's being entrained into the heart is coming from ECMO. Then if you move over to this picture here, you see this smaller red arrow. So you've either decreased the ECMO blood flow or you've increased the native cardiac output so that blood has to be entrained around the cannulas for the heart to maintain its cardiac output. Importantly, VV ECMO does not affect the hemodynamics of, the, uh, of your patient directly. Right? So it's not going to change the, the blood that you um, push back into the patient is the same volume that you're pulling back out. It's completely neutral. So your, car, your heart is going to achieve the cardiac output that is necessary for all of the variety of reasons of things that determine your cardiac output and is totally independent of ECMO. So what we're trying to do with ECMO is we're trying to kind of match as closely as we can the cardiac output so that the blood that does get entrained into the heart has already been conditioned by ECMO with gas exchange. So it's as oxygenated as possible. So as you increase that ECMO blood flow, at least the ratio of ECMO blood flow to cardiac output, you'll improve oxygenation. So over here, you see these pulmonary arteries are more red instead of purple because most of the blood that's coming into the heart has already been oxygenated by ECMO. So going back to the, what we talked about on day one for Steve, um, he's hypoxemic. We see his ECMO blood flow is only three liters per minute, which is pretty low for a VV system. And we see that his, his pressures are not very high. Nobody really knows what the real pressure limits are. It's not really it's an established thing. Um, but um, you could certainly go up higher on this flow. Um, and you can, should, you can leave your native lungs alone and improve this patient's oxygenation. Okay. So um, now let's move to ECMO day three for Steve. Take a look at what's going on here and tell me what you think um, the etiology of his hypoxemia is or something that you wanna do about this, why this is happening and what your, what your intervention's gonna be. And this is, these are the colors of your, your drainage and your return tubing and your chest x-ray.
Great. So you guys are nailed it. We're worried about recirculation in this scenario. So on day one, you guys wanted to make sure we didn't have recirculation. And here's evidence, very profound evidence of pathologic recirculation, where you have this high drainage oxygen saturation or your pre-membrane oxygen sat. And in this case, it's even higher than your peripheral oxygen saturation. And this is going to be, um, in the case of this particular patient that I cared for, you can see the drainage saturation tip is right here. Um, and the return cannula tip is right here. And they're essentially, you're excluding your patient from ECMO because think of it as a vacuum cleaner and a garden hose. Everything that's being pushed back into your patient with the garden hose being sucked out by the vacuum cleaner. And because of that, both tubes are going to be bright red. So looking through recirculation, if we have, again, this normal um, trajectory of blood flow and its uh, relative oxygen concentration with the color coding, if we recirculate, so say that the drainage and return cannulas are quite close to one another with FEMIJ configuration, then some of that blood, that red, that nice thick red arrow going into your heart is going to be split between your drainage cannula and going into your heart. So this means that your heart, in order to maintain cardiac output, will be in training deoxygenated blood around those cannulas, thus resulting in the pulmonary artery really not being as um, is well oxygenated, thus your aortic saturation will be lower. So signs is a falling oxygen saturation peripherally, like your pulse ox in the setting of a rising S pre-O2. And in extreme cases, your both cannulas will be bright red because we are sucking out basically the oxygenated ECMO blood. And just like someone said, you the first move is to decrease the speed because as this is, um, if you have higher speed, you'll have more negative pressure. So you're going to be sucking this ECMO return blood back into the drainage cannula. And then in this particular case with Steve, his cannula position is the problem. Um, so it's important with a, a, in a physical exam finding to add to your daily uh, daily approach to your patients is looking at your tubing color. Um, so on the left side, we have normal, where you have dark red drainage, bright red return, recirculation, you'll have dark, or you'll have both are bright red. And then if you have membrane lung failure or gas flow, sweep gas flow interruption, um, and ECMO is not working, both tubes will be dark red. So here's another example of some chest x-rays where we have uh, uh, cannulas that are far apart and are not going to recirculate versus uh, cannulas that were closer and we were having more recirculation with this particular patient. Again, it depends on the cannulas. There's no specific distance that's needed. It's just when your patient is becoming hypoxemic in the setting of evidence of recirc that you need to do something. So in kind of summary, there's a lot of other things we can do about VV ECMO hypoxemia, but just wanted to call out those two particular things. Assess your ECMO blood flow and whether or not it's optimized. Look at your tubing color change to determine whether or not you have evidence of membrane lung dysfunction or recirculation. And also look at your S pre O2 or your venous drainage oxygen saturation to help you sort out, do you have recirculation occurring? So to circle back with Steve, um, in this case, his cannulas were actually overlapping. Um, and so we need to, we need to withdraw one of the cannulas. All right. So let's move over to VA ECMO. We're going to go back to Sandy. So she, we cannulated her for VA ECMO because she was otherwise pretty healthy. We thought this may be a tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy that she could have native recovery. Her cores were clean on a left heart cath. Um, and she was super sick with that low index and map on rocket fuel with bi V failure. So VA was the right device for her. So how should we improve her blood pressure? Do you feel happy about um, how we're supporting her right now? I'll just take a minute to throw some things in the chat box.
Okay, so I have lots of votes for let's just flow more on ECMO. And I and that that makes sense, right? So let's think about we've got a patient here who is um, um, an adult patient, we're flowing three liters per minute, that's not that much. Um, we generally want to try to bypass them about 80% of their resting required cardiac output. So we should, it's probably going to be higher. I didn't give you her body's surface area, but it's probably going to need to be higher than that. Um, and uh, this map goal, generally, we're going to shoot for somewhere between 60 to 80. And this is a little on the low side, I worry that we're under supporting her, we'd have to look at her other, like, and uh, into um, indicators of organ perfusion, and she's on a lot of vasoactive medications. So I don't think that there's a lot of room to go up with those. So it's probably flows that we need to address. So let's talk about VA ECMO hemodynamics. I think it's helpful to take it back to Ohm's law. And as you adjust things to achieve your mean arterial pressure goal, you think about, is it flow that I need? Is it SVR that I need? Or is it central filling volume or right atrial pressure? So with flow, with VA ECMO, essentially it's just additive of your native cardiac output and your ECMO flow. For systemic vascular resistance, you're either starting vasoconstrictors or vasodilators. And then for your right atrial pressure, central venous volume, you're either giving volume or you're diuresing. So whenever you're thinking about how do I affect my map, thinking about is it a flow, SVR, or volume issue, and how do I want to titrate all the things that we get to mess with as intensivists. So ECMO blood flow and native cardiac output are additive into the arterial system, but importantly, the flow is regionalized because there's a mixing point that occurs based on the relative strength of your native cardiac output and your ECMO flow. And I love that someone mentioned afterload reduction in there because ECMO it's like poison for a struggling left ventricle, right? That's going to increase your LV afterload. So that's the downside to ECMO. Let's look at this early in Sandy's cannulation. She's going to have low cardiac output, this mixing point of where her native heart is going to meet blood flow coming back from ECMO is going to be really proximal in the aorta. And then once she has improvement in her cardiac output, or if we decrease her ECMO blood flow, this mixing point is going to be further down the arch or down into the thoracic or abdominal aorta. So the flow is additive, but where the blood flows mix are gonna be dependent on this ratio of native cardiac output to ECMO flow. So coming back to Sandy, totally agree. We need to increase her ECMO blood flow. Three, three liters per minute is not a lot. Most adults are going to require around four liters per minute, maybe higher. Um, and, uh, and then hopefully we can, as someone suggested, decrease some of this, uh, these vasoconstrictors, because if we're going to improve MAP, it's better to do it with flow than necessarily over vasoconstricting to defend that perfusing MAP. Um, Okay, so let's move on. Day four for Sandy, her ejection fraction's improving. It's now 20% up from 10%. And the ventilator is starting to alarm with increased peak pressures and we're on volume control. Um, here's some data for her. So how do you troubleshoot this? What's going on? And what other information do you want? What would you do for this patient? Okay, so quite a few of you guys are thinking about differential oxygenation and um, 
How do we know that this isn't a membrane lung problem or sweep gas flow interruption? Just to kind of review something we just talked about. Is it that? Great, the color of the limbs, great. So we have nice bright red blood coming out of our ECMO circuit. We have color differentiation, so we're not gonna blame it on ECMO. Um, and we have also this other hint that something's going on with the native lungs. You guys want a chest X-ray? We probably want a chest X-ray. So this was one of my, um, one of my ECMO patients on VA who um, started to have some cardiac recovery. So now the patient's ejecting blood out of the native heart moving more of it through those native lungs and acutely had a big mucus plug and dropped this right lung, became acutely hypoxemic. So um, essentially we need to think about how are we gonna fix the lungs in this scenario? And then we can get into Lily's idea of when we can't and maybe need to do a hybrid configuration. Things get really crazy. <laughs> okay, so um, let's look at gas exchange, regionalized gas exchange with VA. So we have that central venous oxygen saturation. We have the S pre-O2, again, that's going into the membrane lung. And the S post is whatever we did with our FDO2 through our membrane lung, as long as it's working. And then we have the, the blood that did not get sucked out by ECMO and is the mixed venous blood and it goes to the native heart lung system. That's going to then mix with whatever you shot into the aorta from ECMO and is going to make up your aortic oxygen saturation. There's two circulations that are happening in parallel. One's coming from the aortic root, one's coming from the distal aorta or wherever your return cannula is located. Importantly, if your lungs are not working, then the location of your mixing point is as your heart improves and this, or the ratio flow between native heart and ECMO changes and goes up, this mixing point will move down your aorta. And if your heart, if your lungs are not promoting adequate gas exchange and are quite hypoxemic, like our patient here with the right lung collapse, then all the blood ejecting from the left ventricle coming up through the aortic root is going to be fairly hypoxemic. So like someone said that you want to take a look at the right upper extremity pulse oximeter, that's important, right? So this is this whole differential hypoxemia concept where you're gonna see a difference in the oxygen saturation and, and branches of the arterial system coming off the aortic root. So you'll first notice it in the right hand and then you'll notice it in the head and then you'll notice in the left hand and then the lower extremities will almost always be perfused by ECMO so they'll be um, adequately oxygenated. So in this case, we have upper body hypoxemia um, and this regional gas exchange is important because you'll have differential oxygenation and um, you need to think about which lung you need to um, address when you're having issues with inadequate oxygenation. Is it the native lung or is it the membrane lung? And important to always keep that pulse ox on the right upper extremity so that we can detect differential oxygenation as soon as it occurs and do something about it. So hypoxemia on VA ECMO, it's easy. It's much easier than VV. It's one of two things. Either your membrane lung failed or your native lungs are not working and you have differential hypoxemia. So you have to have some native heart recovery in order for you to move that mixing point distal enough along the arch that you can actually pick it up with hypoxemia on your right finger. If you have differential hypoxemia, first move is be an intensivist, try to fix the lungs. If you can fix the lungs, but your heart is still just not able to come off ECMO, not ready, you'll stay on VA, okay? If your heart's recovered, because this is a silver lining situation, you can't have differential hypoxemia or differential oxygenation with or without hypoxemia, unless your heart's actually ejecting some blood through the native heart lung system. So maybe this means that you're actually gonna get ready to come off ECMO, so that's the best case scenario. Okay, well maybe you can't fix the lungs because maybe your patient has ARDS, they, they aspirated, got some CPR, um, contusions, or maybe they have a viral pneumonitis myocarditis syndrome. So maybe like Lily said, we're gonna have to need to convert to VAV where we're going to redirect some of that ECMO blood return into the right internal jugular and throw a third cannula in there. Um, or maybe we'll convert to VV if the heart is recovered enough that we don't need VA support anymore. And the lungs often take longer to recover and are longer runs than the heart. So going back to Sandy, she's hypoxemic. Her membrane lung is functioning. 
Um, she seems like she has decent pulse pressure here, and we saw that her ejection fraction is better. So she's ejecting more blood through her native heart lung system. We know something's going on with the native lungs. Here's her chest x-ray. So we can do some CPT suction, deal with this mucus plugging. And in this case with this patient did fine once we were able to uh, re-recruit, -re recover her uh, native lung function. Okay, so in summary, um, blood flow is moving from the drainage cannula to the pump through the membrane lung and you get to control the sweep. Um, and then moving to a return cannula. Cannulate only with a discontinuation strategy in mind. So being very selective about um, your patients that you cannulate. So the ones that you think that are either gonna recover or you've got a strategy for them if they're not gonna recover. Otherwise you end up with um, uh, really challenging uh, situations of patients who are indefinitely kind of supported on extracorporeal support with no way out. Um, the centrifugal pump is preload dependent and afterload sensitive, so you get to set the speed and everything else is measured. Transducing pressures along your circuit can help you identify where there's been a change in the pressure, a change in the resistance that's affecting your flow if you're having issues with inadequate flow. Increase the sweep gas flow rate to decrease your arterial CO2 tension because this is basically the minute ventilation of the native lung. And then VV oxygenation, improve it with increased blood flow is the central tenant to VV ECMO, but make sure that you don't have recirculation and which would be, um, you would see this with low um, uh, uh, pulse oximeter in the setting of a rising P pre O2. And then VA ECMO flow plus native cardiac output are additive, but importantly, they're regionalized. So wherever they're mixing is going to determine on either side which lung is responsible for the gas tension in that region. So that's where we are at the end. Um, do you guys have questions? And thanks so much for being so interactive. Thank you very much. Uh, that was great. It looks like there's a few questions coming in um, in the yeah. chat. And we do have a couple minutes to handle. And maybe uh, if questions arise uh, that we don't have time to get to, we'll probably only have time for a couple, then uh, you can do over email. Maybe we can post a document in the um, FTS hub. Great. Um, so one question is if both the heart and lungs are bad, do we always do VAV? Usually we're going to try to stick with one modality. The issue with VAV is that your circuit flow is going to be limited by the resistance of your circuit. And you're not usually going to be able to flow a lot higher than five and a half, maybe six liters with the best cannulas. And the more, if you add another cannula, you have higher resistance and you're going to limit your flow because if you flow too high with high resistance, you're going to have hemolysis. So what you end up with is kind of inadequate VV and inadequate VA support. So hybrid configurations are not ideal. Um, and, I, and so what we really try, um, if your patient's on the primary mode, is to support the patient otherwise. Um, so if you're on VV, support their shock with um, medically if you can. And if you need to convert to VA, fine. If you're on VA, really uh, every strategy you can to utilize your native lungs. Um, and, and then if you do need to go on hybrid, which you do sometimes, um, it just, it can be difficult to adequately support the patient with hybrid. Um, and then consider trial proning for ARDS before VV. Absolutely. Um, in patients with ARDS, absolutely prone the patient. Um, and then you can, um, of course, prone the patient on ECMO. There's nothing wrong with that. It's uh, demonstrated to be safe and can be a great way. And theoretically, maybe there are some um, benefits for um, the skin integrity or potentially um, with uh, re-recruitment. We don't, we don't know. We don't have any data for that. But physiologically, it kind of makes sense. So developing protocols for proning on ECMO makes a lot of sense. Um, most ECMO centers are doing that. Um, and early about centrifugal pumps better than roller pumps. So um, centrifugal pumps are pretty much exclusively used in the adult ECMO um, uh, community. And this is because um, we have less, it's, it's just, it's less dangerous um, for circuit rupture. So if you have a roller pump, it's essentially if you have a roller, next time you have a dialysis patient, you'll see that it's basically just pinching the tubing and, and from uh, liquid displacement moving flow through a pump. 
if there's all of a sudden an increase in resistance, like after the pump, then you can build up high amounts of pressure. If it's not servo regulated to deescalate the speed, you'll have circuit rupture. So in general, with adults, we're not using um, roller pumps anymore. Um, actually, I'm not even aware of one that you can buy for adults, all centrifugal. This means you do have to set alarms to monitor your flow because if you have an increase in resistance, it means you won't flow and you won't support your patient, but you won't blow up your circuit. <laughs> okay, I think that's about it for time. Don't hesitate to email with any questions, guys, and um, hope you have fun taking care of your ECMO patients. Thank you, and thanks everybody for joining us. Take care. Bye.